will do. So we're live. Thank you. Okay, fantastic. So um, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, good evening. Uh, good uh, late morning, depending on where you are. Um, my name is Anthony Upward. I'm one of the conveners of this group, and uh, I wanted to start by just uh, quickly doing an acknowledgement of our privilege. Um, the land, wherever you are, uh, is sacred, and each of us is privileged to be here. Um, and the land, the lakes, the sea, uh, nearby all of us has supported human beings for thousands of years and is rich in history, knowledge, and tradition. And we're priv privileged to be the beneficiaries and the stewards of all that has come before on behalf of the seven generations to come. And we invite you to consider in your place how you honor and respect people's indigenous to your place. And today, of course, every place is increasingly the home to peoples from across the world. And we're each grateful to have the opportunity to be where we are today. Um, I'd also like to just acknowledge uh, the place that uh, I, I didn't uh, think about the Christmas one, but uh, uh, I, I'll do it as though I was in Toronto. So uh, I, I would just like to ask you, do you know which watershed you're sitting in today? Uh, in Toronto, Peter and uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, folks are sitting in a watershed known as Russell, uh, known by settlers as Russell Creek, uh, that uh, they and by implication we settlers buried to become a sewer in the mid 1870s. Still been looking for the indigenous name, but they haven't found it yet. Uh, and of course, uh, the delivery of the session anywhere we are is dependent on the watershed in which we sit, uh, from everything food that we eat to how the waste that we produce biologically is uh, uh, disposed of. So um, we are a group of members, organized by our members, for our members, and uh, we are here to mobilize knowledge uh, towards the goal of strongly sustainable business models and everything around those. Um, we um, uh, have a number of projects underway, uh, including uh, Aim to Flourish, which uh, recently chose to affiliate uh, with the group, uh, Reporting 3.0, uh, particularly their blueprint on new business models, uh, the refocus on sustainability program management method, the Lean for Flourishing startups method, the Flourishing Enterprise Innovation Toolkit project, which includes the Flourishing Business Canvas, and last but not least, the Future Fit Business Benchmark. So the number of projects choosing to affiliate with us is, uh, is growing, which is fantastic. Um, uh, I will do another plug and say uh, we need help. Uh, I have been uh, largely doing the meeting organization this month, aided very ably by Peter Jones, uh, but we really do need some help to keep up the social media and, and other things around the advertising. So if you know somebody who has half a day a month uh, with a, an available for six, at least six months for the end of the year, um, then uh, please send them my way, Skype, phone, not email. That would be fantastic. Uh, we also have plans to evolve the group towards the Flourishing Enterprise Institute. Uh, so again, if you're interested in thinking about how you might participate in a more structured way, in a more formal way in your organizations with the work of this group, then uh, reach out and uh, talk to Peter or myself. That would be fantastic. Um, we're also part of a, a larger community uh, that is asking the question, uh, what, what comes after the global goals are officially finished in 2030? Uh, how could we improve the global goals to be better aligned with the science of strong sustainability? And uh, if uh, folks are interested in that, they can now visit our new website, which is flourishinggoals.org, or they can uh, visit us on Twitter at flourishing underscore goals, or use the Twitter handle, hashtag number four flourishing. So with all of that, I'm absolutely delighted this month to uh, introduce a longtime friend of this group and now uh, affiliated as a, a project to this group. Um, many members of our group are directly involved in uh, the work that Claire has been doing over the last uh, three and a half years about. Uh, and uh, with that said, I will uh, hand it over to Claire to uh, lead us through the next uh, approximately uh, uh, hour and 20 minutes in whatever way Claire would like. Claire, yeah. over to you. Thank you. Well, it's so much fun to be here and to see your faces. This is... This is like magic. It truly is that we're all together in one room, mm -hmm. even though we're in South America, North America, um, Europe. I mean, it's really quite astonishing that we can all be together. And I'm called to mind um, a quote by John Muir, the, the famous conservationist, who said in one of his journals 
that we all dwell together in a house of one room with a starry firmament for its roof. And I like to think about that whenever I feel kind of alone or afraid and think, well, I'm actually living in a house that only has one room and everyone is my family and we're all together in this one house that happens to be shaped like a planet for right now. So I'm Claire Summer. I know many of you. I am delighted to see friends from real life. Uh, Professor Ruben Berga from the University of Guelph who is uh, sitting at OCAD, and then friends from Twitter and Facebook, old and new, which is really wonderful. So I have the honor of leading the higher ed initiative called Aim to Flourish, that's based at the Weatherhead School of Management at Case Western Reserve University in Cleveland, Ohio. Although the program is our sort of physical heart is there in Cleveland, we're a really global program, and I actually work full time from my office in New Jersey. And a big secret that isn't out yet, but I'll start spreading the news with all of you because we're friends, um, is that I'm moving the whole operation north. Um, my husband and I are moving to Mid Coast, Maine, yep. um, which isn't isn't really wow. out there yet so keep it under your hat um, but we're it's a it's another step in our family's evolution to be more closely aligned um, with our values and really being in a place where we can truly support a community you know literally the, the physical soil where we're living in a way that I've only been able to do in my own backyard uh, here in New Jersey so Many of you know who David Cooper Ryder is, um, or maybe have heard of Appreciative Inquiry. Is there anyone by just a show of hands who's never heard of Appreciative Inquiry or David Cooper Ryder? All right, so I have the pleasure of telling you that a really nice man named David Cooper Ryder about 30 years ago when he did his PhD at Case Western Reserve, he co-authored a new way of thinking about systems change that would allow large groups of people to be together and rapidly lift together and lift up and showcase what's already really working in, a, in an organization or a team or a family by focusing on what's working. So his work in organizational design um, the innovation that he was able to put on paper and then put into practice is called appreciative inquiry, which means that you look at things in an appreciative way and focus on what's working. It's a strength-based approach. For many of us, it's kind of natural, um, but for many people, it's not. So David's true gift is that he was able to pull together a methodology along with other people. Um, and now appreciative inquiry is a strength-based methodology for large systems change that's used everywhere in the world. It's the springboard for a lot of other work and it's very related to positive psychology research and practice. So I offer that by background because I walked into a room three and a half years ago where David was leading a prototyping design session on the question about how could we make it so that more people knew about all the good things that are happening in business that you just don't hear about. That we know that there's lots of businesses and organizations in the for-profit space that truly are acting ethically and with a sense of justice and an, a for concern for our physical world and for people's dignity. But it's kind of squished down by all the bad news. So that was his inquiry. And he said, let's prototype a better way to do it. I was in the room as a business reporter. I come from the communications world. I made my way as a corporate person and then a freelance person, um, basically doing business communications and was kind of sideways working my way into sustainability writing. Um, that's always where my heart has been. 
that I believe in a greener, bluer world. Um, and I wanted to make a difference in the business world. So David had this idea in the room, my hair caught on fire metaphorically, and I thought, oh my gosh, this is the way that I could make a contribution. Rather than being a writer for sustainable brands or for green biz, where I could do only a handful of really good positive stories a year, if I could be part of a bigger effort, I could truly help more change happen. So the idea is that, <laughs> what if we use the world's business students, of which there are hundreds of thousands of them, who are already engaged in an inquiry into what is business, how am I going to make my way in the world? What, is, what are the contributions I'm going to make to society? And ask them to be detectives and go out in their own community and find all these wonderful examples of business that's already working for the good and health of all of humanity today and the future. Claire, Claire. Yeah. Um, uh, you're not sharing your slides. I don't know if that's intentional at this point. Uh, okay, just check. Just check. Yeah. Thank you very much for, for asking. And so what happened is we invented a project that was that's housed at the Weatherhead School of Management. It's called Aim to Flourish. I joined the project as a volunteer early in uh, 2015 and stuck around until we got our first um, bit of funding from a philanthropist. And our mission was, what if we created and invented a curriculum that we could offer to business school professors that would make it really easy for them to incorporate into their coursework an assignment that would let students be these detectives and go collect really positive stories of positive and profitable business innovation. Now, the mere act of collecting a lot of stories is in itself quite valuable and transformational on an individual level. Um, I would like to, at, at some point, actually turn the meeting over to Professor Ruben Berga, who's with us at in OCAD today, just for, for him to share for maybe just two or three minutes about what the experience has been like for his students at the University of Guelph. Um, but there's also a bigger question. Now that we have, and I'm sort of telling you the end of the story right now, we have over a thousand mini case studies written by students on our website. What's possible now with this body of work that is now growing? And that's actually an open question that I wanna actually Bring to all of you. So for those of you who haven't ever heard of Aim to Flourish or, or anything we're doing, I want to just hit a couple of high points for you so that we know what, what is it she's talking about. We are an assignment. We are the world's first higher ed curriculum that's centered on the UN Global Goals and businesses' role in achieving them. The reason that we latched onto that is that, frankly, I saw the UN Sustainable Development Goals coming down the pike, and the, the ratification process was pretty much wrapped up six months before they were formally adopted in September of uh, 2015. So, 2016, 2016. So, um, we decided that this was gonna be important enough to business that we wanted to embed it into our curriculum from the get-go. We are a story platform that I'll share with you in just a little bit. Um, we're currently the world's largest, and I'm, I'd be happy to have someone knock that claim you know, off of my crown, but as near as I can tell, we're the biggest collection of new stories about positive business innovations that are all written by business students. And before I tell you, I'm, I'm telling you about the what right now, but the why is also kind of cool. Like, well, why would we do this? Like, what might be possible? David Cooperwriter's theory was 
if we could fill the room, the metaphorical room, the space, the paradigm that we all sit in with positive stories about what's going right, we could actually shift the internal story that all of us swim in about business being bad and business being destructive. Now, all of you on this call have not only far surpassed that old paradigm, you are all leaders in creating the space for the new paradigm to flourish. Um, but I talk to a lot of people for whom um, I really need to convince them that business isn't bad, that the old paradigm is alive and well, and it's not going to go out quiet. So we decided to just start working by making it possible for students to discover stories on their own about what's working, where there's wonderful innovation that can be lifted up. And it's very much been an iterative process. We're still very much two and a half years in now, very much still in the initial inquiry about what does it look like when business people are leading and being part of organizations that contribute to wholeness and to dignity and to regeneration of our physical world and protection and preservation of our shared natural capital. Um, I'm in support of all the work that each of you is doing and I am by far the least educated person in this conversation. Um, I just happen to be sitting in the chair and have a couple of talents and skills to make this curriculum available to professors so that we can all learn from each other. And with all of your feedback, I can help make it better. We do have an annual prize, which is really fun. We call them the Flourish Prizes and we have one for each of the 17 sustainable development goals. We actually announced them, uh, goodness, I think it was, it was just the end of last week. I'm trying to remember where I was. <laughs> I've been traveling a lot. And finally, we are based at a business school in the United States, but we're a global program um, that is currently, we're, Aim to Flourish is being taught in 60, 60 classrooms right now across the world. Um, this is just another slide to kind of put us in a, a sort of a framing for what we're doing and why. We believe that global goals leadership and competency is essential to help us all move in the right direction. And I'd also like to state for the record that I am one of those people who feels that the UN Sustainable Development Goals are insufficient and probably existentially flawed on the face of it um, by the fact that they focus on what we don't want instead of what we do want. And I'm still a huge booster for them because they're the best thing we've got. They're a sturdy framework where we can start organizing capital flow and where we need it, policy, where we need it, best practices to get us in the right direction. Um, so that is my, I'm all for the global goals and I know that we really need to get started yesterday on something better, which is why Anthony and I and Bill Craig and a couple of other people are starting to dream about what, what would flourishing goals look like? And how could that truly inspire and excite us to do more than just say, okay, well, we don't want children to go to bed hungry anymore. You know, the zero hunger, it's really a terrible goal. Mm. It's a terribly insufficient goal. It brings people just to the very toehold of dignity and it's just not good enough. But it's a start. Um, we really straddle um, at Aim to Flourish who we're serving. That people like Ruben in the room, he's, a, he's our customer. Ruben is the person who we think about every day and say, 
if we were going to give professors a curriculum and resources, what would make it easy for them? Um, and we're also truly in the business of serving business leaders by helping connect them to students, the best and the brightest everywhere, who are coming to their offices, sitting down and asking them really good questions. Um, and the beating heart, the thing that will never ever stop, no matter what Aim to Flourish becomes, is that at the heart of our assignment, there's an intergenerational interview between a student and a business leader. And by <laughs> asking positive questions using appreciative inquiry, it creates the conditions, a moment where really breakthrough things can happen, where students completely change their mind about how they feel about business. And it happens because they're sitting down and having a conversation with a leader in their community who's already doing it. And it puts the proof in front of them in the shape of a real person um, and it connects people in a beautiful way. Before I get to actually showing you our platform and what we're doing and sort of get under the hood, just a couple numbers on the board. Um, over 4,000 students, mostly um, graduate level business students, but there are cohorts of undergraduates who are doing it with us. Over 4,000 worldwide. We have finally surpassed our thousandth story threshold. Um, the number of 47 schools where Aim to Flourish is being offered is actually out of date. Um, and that's how fast we're growing. So it's really 60, not 47. Um, and our latest count of where Aim to Flourish is being taught is 18 countries. We have over 60 active professors, Ruben being one of them. Um, perhaps Peter and perhaps Simon might want to join the bandwagon at some point. And um, across the globe, the people who've, who've signed on to Aim to Flourish to come to our website and made a profile span 60 countries. And we've done this in two and a half years. Um, I will say that Aim to Flourish, you're looking at half of the paid staff. It's me <laughs> and um, my teammate, Megan, who runs the the day-to-day -day operations side. Uh, she's based in Cleveland. Um, we, of course, have resources um, that support us at the Fowler Center at our business school in Cleveland. Um, but the, the truth of the, the matter is it's me and Megan and the goodwill and friendship of a lot of people across the globe who are helping us. We are a teeny tiny team on a big mission. Um, you're all familiar with the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Is there anyone who's never heard of them on this call? Anyone? Is anyone raising their hand? I can't see everyone. Okay. So more and more, I'm having the experience where people know what I'm talking about. Um, that puts all of us in what I suspect is no more than 1% of, of humanity who, who's really even heard of them. The official UN number is that only one in 10 people have heard of them based on OECD um, uh, surveys, which I don't know how strong that methodology is because OECD is only a slice of a couple of countries. Um, I think one in 10 people knowing about the goals is wildly overly optimistic, um, which means that I've got nothing but runway ahead of me, <laughs> that I get to tell people about them every day. And here in the US, um, it's truly dismal. Um, the with all of the noise and other things that are grabbing people's attentions in the United States, um, uh, it just it just hasn't permeated. Um, you'll find pockets in universities. You'll find pockets in um, K through 12 education, but in the United States, the goals might have may as well have not happened. That's simply the state of it. I'd like to do a quick 
survey here yeah. uh, and ask, of, um, does anybody feel that the percentage, the, the penetration, the awareness of the global goals, how is it doing the policy communities at any level, national, state, state, provincial, local government levels? Gil, maybe you have a perspective on, on that. Yeah, I mean, my sense, Claire, thank you for this, by the way. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. uh, my sense is that it's trending rapidly in Europe and perhaps in some other parts of the world, and it's all but invisible in the States, mm -hmm. uh, with the exception of some of the corporates who are starting to grab to it. Mm -hmm. But in the public policy community, nowhere, and I'm culpable because I very intentionally not introduced it in Palo Alto because it felt like it was too much. Yeah. for people to metabolize given everything else they were metabolizing. Yeah. And any other, Simon, what's, uh, what's it like in, in your part of the world? To be honest, um, you know, there are people working with the sustainable goals in Brazil, but we're talking NGOs. Okay. In terms of meaningful policy um, power, it, it's yeah. really not there right now. But, you know, there are, there are, um, Bits of positivity, but yeah, it, there's nowhere near one in ten. Mm -hmm. Absolutely no near one in ten, and there's a lot of scope for doing a lot of work in Brazil. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'll let some other Canadians chime in here. I, I've actually been quite surprised in the Canadian context that mm -hmm. it's um, in the policy communities. It's um, definitely that's something that's that's been talked about now in in very general terms. Nothing specific yet, I would say. But the question is starting to be asked in, in I think, in, in uh, at the municipal level in Toronto, I've heard it's been talked about a little bit uh, at the provincial level and at the, the national level. Um, so I, I don't think it's, it's uh, it still may only be one in 10 policy people, but it seems to be, and, then, and they're not yet, they're starting to ask the question, so if we're setting a policy on topic X, mm -hmm. how would that policy need to change in order to be able to comply with the uh, contribute to Canada's commitment to the SDGs uh, very early days that nobody's coming up with solutions yet but that comes next mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. and and here here in Norway it's uh, uh you know I presented uh, some of these ideas uh, last week and uh, everybody was nodding nodding their heads yeah as yeah. they've been saying here to me quite a lot it's the Norwegian advantage right so I could go out and stand on my street corner all day and yell at people about the SDGs. Um, it won't it won't make a dent here, um, where I am in the east coast of the United States. Um, so the commitment I've made is that I feel I can make a difference in supporting higher education, business, and management education to say, if I can be part of a vision where every single 100% of students who are pursuing a business degree graduate from their program, wherever that is, knowing what the global goals are, and that they, in their roles as professionals, have a responsibility to help achieve them in their work. Not only as citizens, as human beings, that we all have a moral requirement, I feel, to be working for the betterment of the other living beings on our planet, but that specifically that you don't get to leave your morals and values at the door when you sit down at your desk, that you should be just inspired in the work you're doing for 10 hours a day as you do in your family life, in your community life, in your faith life. So that's kind of a you know, that's a big dream, I know, but it's the one that I'm invested in. If people won't be persuaded by the moral argument, which I think is truly where I want to be, I, I want to be in the business of setting up conversations for people where they have a shift in their own mindset and feel in their heart a courage to be part of Whatever their job is, whatever they're making or doing or selling or buying or trading, that it can be done in a way that is profitable, which is really important. We all need to pay our rent, but it also can be positive. So 
Um, but if you're not persuaded by that, how about $12 trillion? Mm -hmm. So I keep this slide in here because it is the business case. And the reason why deans should care about having Aim to Flourish in their school's learning is because Aim to Flourish students have an advantage. They'll be one of the far, far fewer than one in 10 who can go into their jobs knowing about this opportunity to capture $12 trillion in business opportunity, that they can help be the ones who move businesses that are already in motion to, um, to, to pivot and focus their energy and capital on more sustainable models that go from less bad or bad less slowly to truly regenerative. And, um, and there's just a ton of opportunity because all the legacy businesses out there, you know, this particular um, survey, which I think is, oh, I don't have my little footnote on the bottom of the slide. I'll, I'll get it to all of you. Every, you know, the ones who were surveyed said, oh, it's a great idea. We, it's really relevant, but only a third of them are doing anything about it. So that's the business case for why Aim to Flourish should be part of business education. So now I get to tell you about the thing we built. Clear it's a question a, before you go on? Yeah. Um, do you have a citation for the $12 trillion? Absolutely, yes. Yes, the citation for the $12 trillion is a January 2017 report that was done by a group called the Business Commission, and it was presented at Davos. So WEF Davos 2000, January 2007 Business Commission. Second, the, the, the challenge that I've always found uh, between the moral case and the business case is a deep cultural assumption that they are at odds with each other. Yes. Which, of course, many of us know is not the case. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's the listening, and, it, and the listening is very deep. Um, is that what you've encountered? Have you encountered something differently? How do you engage that gap? And you don't need to address that right now. If it's not in the flow, but I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, so we're sitting in a space where there is no trade-off. Um, that it really does require a frame shift because mm -hmm. the story that got set up that says it has to be either or is a lie. Yeah. It was a deliberately constructed narrative. I'm of the group of people who think that it was literally, you know, set up in a room of men um, to, in Mont, you know, the Montpelier um, group, which I can provide citations for. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't have answers for how we close that gap, Gil, but what I know is that there's high potential for mindset shift when people sit down and talk to each other. Mm -hmm. So Aim to Flourish is an assignment that requires students to sit down and have a positive interview with, um, with a business leader and ask them what's going right with your business. Mm -hmm. I think the, uh, the other thing that we've been uh, uh, finding on the business case side of things, and obviously we have people like Bob Willard in our group, um, and recently Mark Van Cleef, um, is that um, people oh, forget that the conditions in which businesses need to be viable are going to be changing, are, are changing. Yeah. And so, um, Essentially, it's a normal competitive situation, except for factors that are historically somewhat unusual that you need to now pay attention to. And uh, we also now have some good data that says that long term planning is more profitable. Um, I think you're going to see some very interesting um, legal things happening around this in the not too distant future. 
some of the things I've been hearing are, are correct. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if all of this will change in what I'm hoping will be somewhere north of the 40 years I have left on this planet. I'm increasingly aware that I will be gone <laughs> pretty soon, um, somewhere in the neighborhood of 40 years if I keep myself health healthy. So I'm not waiting, and I'm kind of trying to grow where I'm planted, and I have the wonderful opportunity with Aim to Flourish to make it possible for students to collect and write and then publish these little mini case studies about a business in their community where something is going right. It's a business innovation in a for-profit company that is making money for the business as a core part of the business, not bolted on, not philanthropy. And if anybody says it's not possible to make money by doing good, I can say, well, you know what? I have a thousand and twenty examples. And this screenshot was pulled on Monday, and we're a thousand twenty. And I literally haven't checked today to see how many more stories we've added. I would love the opportunity to walk anybody who wants to through the website um, at any time. But the easiest thing for you to do is just go to aimtoflourish.com. And everything that you would want to know about the program is all here. Under resources, we have all the, uh, all the resources made available to professors, which is classroom materials, PowerPoints, videos, links to global goals resources, um, links to curriculum, uh, syllabi that other professors are using. And we have a professor community, a professor Facebook group, Really, the invitation is, if you've got students and you want to offer them an experiential assignment that lets them learn about positive business and find out more about how can a business be structured so that it can serve its customers, make, you know, make enough money to sustain itself and be a good corporate citizen, please come and and let me let me help you have aim to flourish with your students. Um, this is out of order. This is just a map of the world showing you all the countries where aim to flourish professors professors and students are located. Um, and you'll see that we do have a little bit of a top heavy um, in the United States, um, but we have. Really, the biggest, fastest growth is in, in South America, which is due to our friends in Colombia and Argentina um, and the north in Mexico. Um, uh, Gustavo is one of our, just one of our best professors beside Ruben. He's at Externado in Colombia. And there's an amazing amount of business transformation and innovation work happening in Colombia. Um, and he shared this with reflection with us. The Aim to Flourish initiative has allowed me to see how the dreams of a more constructive and committed business sector come true and to inspire so many young people so that they can contribute to the construction of a better world. Um, and that's one of over a thousand reflections that I have um, from all the people who've either done the assignment as students or as professors. Um, we don't yet have any really good data from, from our, our business leaders who are interviewed as part of the assignment. We're going to be adding that. Um, but that's the data we have, that there's at least one really meaty um, uh, doctoral thesis in it. <laughs> um, I actually have some colleagues in Sweden who are starting to work on a paper for us for Harvard Business Review. Um, and then this is, I think, the last slide. Um, every year we take all the stories that were published. Um, last year it was 504 stories. And we 
we sort of winnow them down and say, which stories are the best examples of what's going right, of positive and profitable business innovations? And what if we selected one for each of the global goals? Um, so this year's winners were just announced. Um, and this little photo collage just has some of the photos from them. And I just want to tell you about the top left and the bottom right. Um, top left is a person who works for Grayston Bakery, which is located in Yonkers, New York. Um, they're the people who make the brownies that go in Ben and Jerry's ice cream, which um, Ben and Jerry's is owned by Unilever, which is one of the world's largest consumer products company in the whole world. Um, Grayston Bakery bakes brownies to, to hire people. They don't hire people to bake brownies. Um, they have a very fantastic business innovation called open hiring, which is you put your name on the list and the next time there's an opening for a job and your name comes up, you're hired. The innovation is they got rid of HR, they got rid of job applications, they got rid of all the barriers to entry that prevent people, especially those who've been, who are formerly incarcerated people, um, the barriers that prevent people from being able to get a job. They just said, we'll take you, show up, we'll train you, we'll put you on the line. Our job here is we bake brownies, so that's the job that we're offering you, and it works. They churn out 50,000 pounds of brownies a day. Um, and they're our 2018 Flourish Prize winner for Global Goal 17, which is partnerships for the goals. Because as you learn about their story, they're integrating what each person needs with what the community needs, with what the business needs, with what their larger stakeholders need in their supply chain in a way that is truly inspiring. And bottom right, um, it's an innovation by a Dutch company, um, and I'm not gonna pronounce it correctly, forgive me, but the product is called Life Straw. It's those blue straws that the children are holding. You can stick that straw into really, really, really unsanitary water, and as you pull up through the straw, you're able to drink clean, safe water. It's a portable water filter um, that is easy for people to use, easy for, for people to carry around. And we all know goal three, um, good health, and also goal six, clean water and sanitation. For children under the age of five, death from diarrheal diseases is um, absolutely a human tragedy. Um, so this year we're, we're honoring the manufacturers of Life Straw for Global Goal 6, clean, clean water and sanitation. So now what happens with all these stories? Like, who cares? Um, we've done a great job of providing a curriculum for professors to use with their students. Students love it because they get out of the classroom, they get to meet a business leader, they have a really easy way to get in front of a, a wonderful business leader by saying, hey, I'm doing a class assignment and I want to ask you about what's going right at your company. Um, business leaders love it because they get to meet the, the brightest and boldest. Um, but now we're really at the so what. <laughs> this is definitely the last slide. Um, we're now in the inquiry of well, what do we do now with over a thousand stories? Um, what's our strategy to amplify these stories in media and, in, and use them for research? Um, what are the partnerships that we could be building? Um, how does this play out in students' lives outside the classroom? And especially, we remain a core focus on how do we continue to support student learning in the classroom? Um, sort of in closing for the formal presentation, 
I've shared a lot of detail. I've gone from kind of methodology and frameworks and paradigms. Um, the global goals are a, a deep ocean of subject matter that we could, you know, spend years talking about. Um, at the end of this, what we're concerned about with Aim to Flourish is how can we support the world of for-profit enterprise so that it is good, so that it provides for dignity and decency everywhere, for uplifting human souls and capacity. And the way we're doing it is using appreciative inquiry um, to help students have a great conversation with someone who after they write the story and it's published on our website, aimtoflourish.com, student may use it on their LinkedIn. That's kind of the least that happens. Sometimes we have students who've gotten jobs as a result of their Aim to Flourish assignment and also internships, even a board seat, um, because we know that employers are looking for talent, that can, people who can think, people who have heart, um, people who are committed to purpose, and that's also the kind of jobs people want. So shifting gears, um, David Cooper Ryder started us on this journey, but then he went on sabbatical and he went on to do some other research projects. But two months ago, he came back to lead the Fowler Center where I work full time and David's back, and as a true visionary, he's never content to let things kind of just be. So he's actually charged me to, to say, how could Aim to Flourish lift up a city or a region? And we're starting with Cleveland. Um, next year, 2019, will be the 50th anniversary of the Cuyahoga River in Ohio catching on fire. It was a national disgrace, um, an environmental disaster. And it's still really dirty. It's not, it's no longer flammable. But on that 50th anniversary, we're gonna be announcing kind of the next set of goals for what could, what could Cleveland be when it's a green city on a blue lake? Because it is actually a, uh, a formerly major industrial city um, on a Great Lake. So Gil, obviously I have conversations to come with you for all of your expertise with Palo Alto, but at this point I'd love to stop talking. I would love to hear from each of you as, as, as you'd like, the questions that come up, the possibilities that come up, um, and I'm very interested in the work of this collected community with strongly sustainable business models. And Antony knows I've been trying to get the content of the Flourishing Business Canvas into the Aim to Flourish curriculum explicitly. I think we're in a better spot to do that now than we were a year ago. Um, and kind of with that, I'd love to open the, the, the room for sharing conversation questions Thank you. Thank you so much. And again, I'm very much a student to all of you here today. Thank you. Thanks, Claire. Uh, Anthony, what do you think? Um, can we open it up for questions uh, in the live room first? Uh, uh, I actually, I have one because I have one for Ruben. Uh, Claire, you had suggested that there might be a few things that Ruben could say from his experience. And, and it might be, since it's still so fresh from, from your presentation, Ruben, if uh, we could put you on the spot and hear um, about your experience at University of Florida sure. and where you maybe address also there with a question on your mind. Okay, perfect, thank you. Hello everyone. Claire has been a leader in getting this uh, going. So I'll give you a little bit of background. About three and a half years ago at Guelph, we made corporate social responsibility a required course 
for all business students, everybody who graduates with DCOM. So from that time, I also started to teach CSR, and around the same time, Claire was launching the game Flourish, and I don't quite remember how we stumbled into each other, but somehow, I believe maybe our dean put us in touch, Julia, my dean put me in touch with you, Claire. And the first semester we started looking at this, I, I was actually in charge of uh, developing and running this corporate social responsibility class. I, I thought, this is still an early stage program, let me try and use it as a bonus assignment for students. Kind of a trial to see how students will react and how everybody would uh, integrate into it. Well, two and a half years later, it is now a, a, a very focused and important part of our CSR course. Uh, we teach this three semesters per year. Now, every class has 200 to 250 students, so big classes. Um, it is run on a face-to-face -face and a distance education also. Uh, so the way we actually run this, it's interesting because Claire's statement about the SDGs is very relevant also. I also, our class, to give you another bit of, of uh, background, the people who take this class are third and fourth year undergraduates. So they are not graduate students. They're undergraduates. They're about 80% in some kind of a BCom program. It's also an elective for other programs. So I have environmental engineering and computer engineering and computers, a bit of everything in that classroom. So the key thing is at the very start of the semester, the foundation is the sustainable development goals. So that is the statement that Claire said about maybe one in ten people not being aware of the SDGs is pretty much bang on, maybe even less when they even at the stage that they're at. So the first thing is we get them involved with that. Second thing, I get them involved right away with ethics, ethics research, morals. Part of the reason is that with our university. If you are going to go into the field and to interview human participants, we need to have ethics approval. So I have a blanket ethics approval for my course, and I end up being the ethics officer for the group of people that I have. It's almost a mini organization. So what the students? It's a big group. Yeah, it's a big group. Yeah, and, and undergraduates can sometimes do random things. That's exactly <laughs> right. Very random. So. What they have to do is complete a, what they call the uh, C-O-R-E core, right. okay, the research ethics, right. So they have to complete that and provide a certificate that they've actually completed it before they even start doing any interview. By week two, week three, the class has been broken up into groups of five. So I have these groups, about 40 to 50 groups that are together for the whole semester for all the assignments. I found this to work best. Now, these groups um, have, after two weeks, started to form. And as they've gone through the core and the ethics work, and they've gone through the SDGs, now I introduce them into the process of appreciation inquiry. So it has to be gradual, because if I plop them in into the cold water, half of them are scared, the other half of them are next going on. So gradually, I am working through the whole idea that okay, we're going to do a process of appreciative inquiry. This is after we talk about morals and ethics and what's good about business and why business should be for good and so forth. Now, I spent about a class talking about appreciative inquiry in like, oh. session. Everybody talks to each other. And as they talk to each other, we get them to do a natural appreciative inquiry exercise. This is actually found in the resources section of the episode. So there's a way to do that. But I have a tofu wrap. Mm -hmm. Then, oh, mute you guys. Somebody, somebody out there might mute who's. Uh, oh, I'm sorry for smashing the thing. Okay. I'm sorry, so, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Did you break it? So now, at this point in time, they are given a task. So I give them the assignment. It's like this. The assignment actually works about 25% of their grade. I'm sorry, I'll buy you. Um, Phil, I, I think you need to you mute your mic. Yeah, if you could. We can hear something in the background. And you're the only person not on mute, I believe, who's not talking. All right. Oh, on mute. 
Peter, you could, you could mute Gil from your side as well. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, and I think on Dean as well. Oh, she's muted. All right, great. All right, so later, thanks. So, so this is just a build-up. At this point in time, we get to the point where I give the assignment. The assignment is worth 25%, which is made up of 15% for the actual assignment and 10% for reflection on the assignment. So the reflection is an individual part, so everybody has to reflect at the end of the assignment. The 15% is a group mark. So what they do, they're given the task of going to your local community. The word is local, wherever local is from. Because University of Guelph is a suburban type of university, we have people from Ottawa, from Toronto, from Kitchener, from everywhere. So I say, if you find a, a, a business for profit in your community, if it's in Hamilton, fantastic. But pick a business that's a for profit business, generally it tends to be a small to medium sized enterprise. Because I say, you have to get approval in your consent form from the person who can give approval to be interviewed about the business. You have to tell the business that they're going to be potentially featured in the global site. You have to tell them that you're going to be asked them questions about what they do. And you have to be authorized to be able to share the pictures, the interview, and all the rest, the rest of that stuff. Okay? So at that point in time, and through the, through the, the, the process of hard knocks over two years, I've learned that you don't send five kids into an interview. <laughs> it's a mess. So you get them to talk to each other and say, all right, two, maybe three of you will go into the interview and you will try and record the interview if possible. Face-to-face -face interview is ideal. There is a, a, um, a, a list of questions that Aim to Flourish provides that guides the interview. It's like an appreciative inquiry. Very much. Study structure, it's appreciative inquiry. And based on that interview, they have to come back and write a story in their so by writing this narrative, they have to condense what the interview was. So they submit that as part of the assignment. Another part of the assignment that I've implemented over the past two semesters is for them to do a poster. Claire actually saw the first set of posters we did. So as they're doing the poster, they're graphically thinking about what's so great about this company. What's the innovation? And then later on in the semester, about week five or so, there's a competition to see which poster is best where they all actually vote on the poster. Mm -hmm. And this is a fun part of the assignment for them because then they get a grand prize, a $10 gift certificate or something like that. And plus they also get some good marks for doing that, for being appreciated by their own teams. So that's a big part of it. And another part of it is to actually submit the story into the Aim to Flourish site, which means that they have to make sure that whatever they write has to be comprehensible. Somebody has to read it, understand it, and do a minimal amount of editing. Claire and Megan do an amazing job in helping us. I can tell you that three years ago, the first stories we sent were absolutely um, scary. They weren't very well written. But uh, I sub subsequently asked the students to tune up their writing skills yeah. because I told them this is going to be featured on a global basis. Yeah, yeah. So in the end, because everything has an end, at about week five or so, they've completed the assignment. They've submitted everything. Um, about 60 to 70 percent of the stories that are submitted actually make it on to the yeah. As you can imagine, so the group of 45 groups, for example, maybe 25 to 28 actually make it. There's yeah. always about 10 to 15 who don't want to get the extra effort. And all they do was submit it, and that's fine. Yeah. But there's a big group that actually submitted and actually learned something from it. Yeah. I can guarantee at the end of the semester, I've got my 230 students, they all know about the sustainable development goals. Yeah. They all have appreciations for how business can actually do good. And in fact, some of them actually go on and create their own social entrepreneurial companies. In yeah. other cases, some of the businesses who actually end up being interviewed twice come and tell us that they actually have learned from the first interview and they were asking themselves, so why are we doing this? Mm -hmm. And adjusting their businesses accordingly. Yeah. So if there's a, a benefit to the students, benefit to the businesses, and to the teachers, a bit of a logistical uh, um, slate of hand that you have to do, yeah. but the benefit is they actually learn from the real world. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You can see that from the re reflections that they actually write. 
because there's 200 reflections that come in, and most of them actually have positive things to say about it. And Ruben is pretty much, um, you know, he's like the best case, the best, the best servant to this work in terms of he's really made it come alive with his students. Um, he's made it a major part of his teaching and learning. And what's really neat is that the experience goes from the kind of in-depth um, work that Ruben students are doing. It can also be done in a much lighter fashion. Um, because sometimes professors, they have a more compressed time scale. With graduate level students, we tend to not do as much um, of the step by step. We do dunk them in the cold water a little bit more. Um, but Ruben has just given us so much. Um, and your support and your reflections and your constructive criticism has made it better for thousands of students around the world. Um, I have a question now. So okay. I'm my question. <laughs> so my question to you, Claire, is now that we have these thousand stories, and it's the same question I think that you were asking. Yeah. How do we leverage right. those thousand stories? Yeah. And how do we do yeah. That? So a simple answer to it is that it now becomes a rich collection and resource, um, just as using as examples, and that can be sorted regionally, can be sorted by industry, just for professors and educators to use as, you know, it is possible for business to be positive and profitable, and let's go over a couple of neat examples that happen to have been written by mostly young people. When we say students, they, they're tending to be mostly people under the age of 30, which is also really attractive. Um, but that is an open question, Ruben, that I have brought to David Cooper Ryder, and he really wants a book series. So as soon as I figure out how to stop sleeping, we're going to have <laughs> a name of our book series. Um, I want to um, touch on some of the other, and thank you, Ruben. Thank you for, for talking through how you use it in your class. Um, I want to scroll up to, um, there's a wonderful question from Douglas, and you're asking if we've encountered organizations that have woven into their core DNA the imperative to engage in customer client in education. Um, the answer to that is, I've run into it in my own work, but we aren't currently putting a lens or a focus on the actual organizations and learning about what we're learning from them. We're just because we're young and we're tiny, we've really been focused on the student experience. I saw that Simon um, uh, answered down thread that in his uh, customer experiences with Soul, he gets into that. So if Simon hasn't done one of these already, and I suspect he has, I'd love a whole, you know, a whole um, monthly meeting just on that work. Um, Anthony asked um, a really big challenge. Um, we've now done the Flourish Prizes judging twice. It was, he asked for a, a challenge that the, the judges had and the jurors. Um, we made our lives a lot easier. We learned from the experience last year. Um, and the biggest challenge this year, um, it, was, it was really quite smooth, but We've set up a pretty good set of criteria and guide rails for the, for the jurors, and we've also winnowed it down to semifinalists. So the answer to your very good question, Anthony, is uh, we tried to make it as simple as possible, and it went pretty smoothly this year. So it's, that's not maybe, you know, I wish I had a, a more interesting um, answer. Um, Simon asks a great question, and I think that's incredibly rich for discussion. How can the Flourishing Business Canvas help people better understand the systemic relationships between the goals? Um, you know, we all know that, you know, having the goals, you know, in a little, in bricks that are separate from each other, that, that's a design flaw, um, because the very, very smart people who invented 
the, the brick layout with the boxes. They did a marvelous job, um, but the one thing that's not visually represented is how they're truly interdependent. Um, with the Aim to Flourish assignment, we let the students discover this on their own by allowing them the discovery of telling us what goals this business innovation is, is helping achieve. And the students say, well, I have to pick five boxes because it's not just a story about clean water. It's not just a story about reducing inequalities between people. It's, it's kind of a whole bunch of things. So, and to your quest, the second question about um, how can um, businesses reflect on and learn about the SDGs in the context of their own business, we are very much at the beginning of that inquiry. What do the goals really mean for businesses? We don't have an answer to it yet. Um, we know that the goals need to be real and relevant for businesses, but from the perspective of Aim to Flourish, we are still very much at the step of helping businesses start to encounter the goals, to start to contemplate them and start inquiry. Um, and I will say that as to Gil's earlier point that NGOs are kind of, oh no, I think it was you, Simon, who said that the, the NGO space is where more of the action is. Um, you know, the big corporates are starting to grapple. I'm actually getting on a plane in the morning and going to Minneapolis to meet with the Medtronic leadership team. They are a giant uh, uh, medical device and technology company. They make um, um, implantable um, pacemakers. Um, pacemakers, yeah, uh, pacemakers and, and valves and bits and bots, and they, they uh, serve people living with diabetes, with technology. Um, the Medtronic leadership team is, has asked my team to be engaged with them around the SDGs. So the answer is there's fruitful work to be done. Um, we're just not there yet. Uh, yeah, I just want to comment really briefly yeah. because uh, Maria and myself, we have run courses where we get both the sustainable development goals and the flourishing canvas together. Mm -hmm. And um, it's in Brazil, in the UK, and in Greece as well. And what we find is that the flourishing canvas, we use this, use it almost as a dialogue tool. And it then really helps people reflect on the interconnections between the goals. And this is why it was interesting to hear that you're kind of still at that point where you're looking at how you could possibly bring yeah, the yeah. canvas to the curriculum. Yeah. Uh, it has been, you know, really interesting there because also, you know, you've got the natural step and you've got future fit goals. Yeah. Great. But they're kind of diagrams if you look at their material. Yeah. And with the canvas, it, it really helps to generate stories. And also, it's, it, thank you very much for this presentation, because the other thing is your students are currently going out and hearing about positive stories. But then, then I'm also thinking, what if they went out and had dialogues with people who are maybe looking to understand the sustainable development goals? And therefore, they could get, it's almost business learning from your students as much as the students going out and learning from things that are already working well. And obviously, we don't live in a black and white world. You know, there are companies that are doing great stuff, but other parts of the organization may be not doing great stuff. So it's, this is why, you know, Maria and I, we work a lot with dialogue. And we actually often help large organizations learn from what's working well in one bit of the organization to help put that into another part, into another group, another company. But yeah, no thanks. I've been really enjoying this talk. Mm. I really appreciate Simon's, uh, Simon, your uh, uh, response there that helps, I think, bring some context to uh, what I was going to respond to with the Rubens uh, story. Because what struck me in, in what you were saying, Ruben, is how, um, how the businesses were especially responsive to the second interviews or to the follow-up from the students. So if small and medium-sized enterprises are, are start to kind of get the bug and understand uh, the context of the SDGs, 
and the goals of the interview, perhaps even learn, learn something in the reflection from the AI interview. It would seem that just uh, setting up you know, this series of dialogic encounters would be incredibly fruitful for, you know, for, for continuing the process with businesses. It could be a type of action research, uh, following up from those original interviews, um, of course, holding the same type of interview again, and creates a, a type of dialogue with, uh, with the, you know, the, the uh, business informants in, in that particular uh, exercise. And so it's, so I realize that they're, they're creating uh, capsule case studies that can be used in the aim to flourish site and then can highlight kind of the outcomes of the business. But I wonder if kind of a longer term impact in some ways might be all these, you know, uh, ways that the business starts to change and be in, in learning from, you know, from this type of community. And so reaching more and more students with this type of um, inquiry, I mean, it's, it's seen as perhaps even innocuous, and helpful, helpful to education, but it's, it's, it's counter, it's non-competitive in, in any way. It's, it's, it's a shared in your story. Um, and so it seems like it's a, it's a really a powerful way to in, encounter um, businesses at the level where it's the very start of some change in their thinking could occur. So have, have you found that clear, like there are other ways into uh, organizations mm -hmm. through uh, the end of flourish process? Is that another, mm -hmm. you know, do you have special, do you have partners that are coming on board that are, mm -hmm. You know, that are kind of drawn to the movement here? Yeah. Um, well, I, I, I truly feel like I'm at a cocktail party that's like way out of my league. Um, and I mean that with sincerity um, because Simon and Maria are doing this deep engagement work and um, Undine and Anthony are doing this deep work and you, Peter, are doing it with, with all your research. Um, the answer is yes, we should have um, better, stronger pathways between the kind of doorway, the beginning of a conversation that we start, and then the what happens next. How can we truly be serving the business community, you know, individual leaders, teams, entire organizations in truly deep transformational ways? Um, some of that could look like maybe we should have a partnership that's more formalized with, you know, just as an example, um, with the consulting work that Gil does or the work that Maria and Simon do. Um, I don't want to leave anybody out. Uh, we simply just haven't had the bandwidth to do it. Um, so I'll be very appreciative for all of you to just keep these ideas coming because as I'm able to put them in a shape that I can make a proposal and say, what if we started small and started doing this now? We have obvious alliance and you know aligned efforts with the Strongly Sustainable Business Model Group and all the work that's happening. Um, oh, Simon's just making a wonderful comment about working with young leaders and the, and the Flourishing Business Canvas. And this is just so exciting. I, I wish that we all could work together every day. <laughs> um, yeah, we're just, um, like I said, I represent 50% of, uh, of the staff power. Um, but now that David is back at the center full time, as of February 1st, um, he is kind of a, you know, he's a guy that attracts um, major funding which is really good if you work at a university. Um, so I'm really hopeful that we'll have capacity. Um, so that's my best answer today is I love all these ideas and we need to figure out how might we start? What's the smallest first step we could take? So, uh, Claire, you'd asked the question about the cities uh, side of things. Um, so, I, I did. Um, I had this uh, observation about the business alliance for local living economies, and I 
just a quick look and there's several people in the uh, fellows of, of Bali who are in Cleveland itself um, and uh, yeah. I've certainly heard the Cleveland Foundation talk uh, yeah. about a lot of the amazing things that have been going on to try and connect the uh, university and medical uh, hub I think it's called the Cleveland Circle to the things that are immediately around the Cleveland Circle in, in business terms where there's a lot of uh, challenges economically uh, so uh, uh, perhaps this is a, a good starting point and it's uh, w worth mentioning Peter uh, in his uh, some of his work has uh, taken the flourishing business canvas and uh, taken it up a scale uh, to ask how would you de design a flourishing city uh, and so we actually do have a design uh, Peter, how would you describe the status of that uh, these days? I think I think it's uh, in in uh, testing. Uh, is that a fair uh, fair way of describing it? It would be a fair characterization. Yeah, you know, we we started with the idea of flourishing cities with uh, out of uh, the urban ecologies conferences that are being hosted here at OCAD. In fact, if anyone's interested in this year's um, urban ecologies and essentially flourishing. Cities Conference, which is an international conference. It's um, that's uh, it. so. It's I think it's Urban Ecologies. If you look that up at OCAD, uh, the date would be um, I think it's I believe it's in October, and they're accepting uh, proposals for all types of of uh, sessions. So it's not a traditional just research conference, but there will be. Uh, dialogues, different conversation approaches, uh, pres poster presentations, panels. Could, could and you put the link to that? April 19. So we actually developed our canvas out of one of these conferences, doing workshops in the uh, uh, urban this urban ecologies design, uh, sustainable design for cities context, and realized that it started started to become, uh, or that we could really grow that uh, that new. It's kind of slightly changed uh, canvas to an approach that can be used for all types of uh, policy proposals. And so one of the things that we learned in the Strategic Foresight Innovation Program, the master design program that, that we've been teaching here at OCAD now for nine years, we originally started the program. We had a business model innovation and a policy innovation course uh, aligned without tools. And we started using the Osterwald canvas because he was actually a friend of ours here. We were involved with his, his original canvas and used that for the business model innovation. We've never had, you know, we've had to kind of shoehorn things into the uh, business model canvas uh, on the policy side. So we're developing uh, now a, a really a, a more of a full, full, con full policy context, uh, flourishing, um, flourishing social policies canvas that we're also using in climate change action planning and getting into use around Toronto and, and other Canadian contexts. In testing though, but actually I guess you could say use. We're testing and continuing to develop it. My graduate students are going to be helping me with advance of the summer. So as we so, continue to build Peter, the I, I found the uh, presentation uh, that you made from uh, DWD uh, on, on this when it was in its original development phase. Uh, I think uh, the cup, uh, that was back in 2016. So that link I just put in slide 23 if you want to see the canvas and mm -hmm. the slides leading up to it, explain it in some, uh, explain its background. But I think you mentioned there was a conference coming up as well. Could you put the link to the conference into the chat as well, please? Oh, yeah, yeah, I can do that. Okay. Yeah, so we're, we're just coming up to the hour. Um, and uh, Claire, I don't know if you had any uh, closing remarks or reflections from uh, the co conversation that you'd like to share with us before uh, we, we finish. We try and finish uh, on time as best we can. Um, well, just to share my appreciation um, for how wonderful it is to be part of this community, for the opportunity to learn from all of you. Um, I'm the new kid. You know, now it seems like it's three and a half years already. I'm learning as fast as I can. Every time Anthony and I talk, um, I get another book um, put on my shelf. And speaking of books, I actually do have just a little something really fun to plug that happened today. Um, 
many of you know the work of Raj Sisodia with Conscious Capitalism, um, which is a big movement that you know got a good bit of wake. Um, it's you know it's it's not as far along or progressive or integrated as some of the work we're talking about here, but it's an important community. And um, Raj's new book came out today. It's called The Conscious Capitalism Field Book. And there's an essay in it by one of our benefactors, uh, Chuck Fowler. Mm. And um, it heavily features Aim to Flourish because I'm the one that wrote it. Uh -huh. um, so if you happen to check out that book out today, um, Chuck's essays in it, I'm just thrilled that um, you know, once again, that we're getting to contribute to a, a, a bigger global conversation. Um, there's plenty of challenge to go around for all of us. Um, I'm committed to this little slice of how can I make business education more supportive for student learning that helps us, um, you know, have a have a world worth living for when I'm an old lady on my bed. Um, dying, you know, sometime 40 years or so from now, um, I'll be very satisfied that I spent my 40 years um, doing my part, and uh, I'm just grateful to be doing it with all of you. That's great. Thank you very much, Claire. Uh, and uh, if you'd like to share the citation and URL for that uh, okay. book in the chat, uh, I think you'll have a, a number of immediate uh, uh, clicks on, uh, on that. Um, so um, I, I would uh, just highlight that uh, in the past month, uh, we've been, Claire and has been a friend of this community uh, since the very start of to Flourish. Uh, Chris Laszlo, uh, while he was executive director, has also been a friend. And David has been uh, contributing uh, through Claire and myself, occasional posts to the group. Uh, so uh, Claire, please uh, thank David for his support and uh, please pass on our warm wishes and yeah. good luck. Uh, and we really hope that uh, he's able to come and present to us his latest thinking on yeah. uh, flourishing, which, as he says in his uh, article from last year, is the, the largest uh, flourishing is the largest organizational design opportunity that we have in front of us in the 21st century. I think it would be fantastic if uh, David came and, and joined up some dots for us. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I'm, I'm uh, as I said to Claire, as we were just convening uh, uh, that. Uh, uh, when these days uh, we're booking quite a long number of months into advance, but if uh, David wants to come and talk to us, we'll, uh, I think everybody will be happy to uh, relinquish their spot. Um, uh, I also wanted to mention that um, uh, Doug uh, is uh, working with me to see if we can get Kate Rayworth, uh, the author of Donut Economics, to talk. Uh, she um, uh, is well connected to reporting 3.0 and uh, we chatted briefly after uh, her, her fantastic talk that she gave in Copenhagen about a year ago now uh, and uh, really hoping that uh, we can make that happen soon. Uh, next month we have two student uh, presenters, mm -hmm. uh, one uh, from uh, uh, both of them students connected with our member uh, Professor Nancy Boken uh, who's now at um, Lund University in Sweden, but at the time that uh, these two students were working with her, they were at Cambridge, uh, focused uh, in combination on benefit corporations in the British context and on circular economy, I believe in the Canadian uh, context. So we'll have two presenters next month. Uh, the month after that, we have uh, a very early member of the group, Dr. Florian Ludecker Freund, who has uh, just completed with one of his master's students a um, piece of work on patterns related of business models related to uh, uh, sustainability. Uh, this is a piece of uh, descriptive science work, so obviously he's only able to do patterns based on what currently exists. Uh, but uh, we've been, uh, uh, Peter, uh, Florian is very interested to see how we might think about extending that work to strongly sustainable patterns. And Claire, the typology that he's come up with might also be another way of analyzing the stories uh, that uh, Aim to Flourish has been building. So, um, yeah, uh, we have a, an exciting, uh, and, and I have more to tell about other presenters after that, but I'll, I'll stop at this point. So uh, until uh, this time next month, thank you again, Claire. Uh, the recording will be posted uh, by Peter uh, in, the, in the Google Drive. Claire's going to share slides, so and we'll post the links.